Today we continue our look at making sense of the Bible, and I invite you to, uh, to take a look at our, our GPS insert. Um, this is something that you can use as a, a part of your own uh, devotional time um, as a follow-up to the, the worship um, today, and uh, it has uh, some place there for some notes. Um, I know that it's tempting to look at your grocery list and fill that in, but, but it's actually for, uh, for maybe perhaps notes that you might find worthy of remembering that you can bring up in conversation with family and friends later in the day or during the week. Some people are using this in uh, what we're calling the GPS um, small groups, and, uh, and that's an opportunity to, to gather with others um, for a time of support together, and this is used as their way of gathering is to uh, have a discussion about uh, the worship uh, from the previous Sunday. So I do commend to you um, our gather, pray, support uh, insert today. Last week, we began our look at making sense of the Bible by making sense of the uh, Hebrew scriptures, the Old Testament, and today we take a look at the New Testament, as I shared with the children. Sometime earlier in this week, I, uh, I began wondering whether or not this was a worthy idea. You know, should we really be doing this? I mean, these don't even feel like sermons for me to prepare. Uh, and so I'm not, I was wondering about whether or not these feel like sermons to, uh, to the congregation. You know, is this more like a lecture? Is it, does it feel like um, I'm, uh, I'm just sharing the, the beginnings of a, a kind of Bible 101 and, uh, and you've all been through this? I got to thinking about that. I was in conversation with someone who was uh, kind of making me explore that thought. And um, I was even wondering, are any, is anybody going to come back, you know, for, for take two, uh, making sense of, uh, of the New Testament? I, I got to thinking about that. Well, I was visiting with Karen, my wife Karen, and she has uh, recently started um, being a music director at St. Tim's uh, United Methodist Church. And one of the things that's new for her is that she's never um, been a bell choir director. And so this is all new, um, and she's been asked to She's been in bell choirs, but she's never directed one, and so she didn't really know where to begin. And, uh, and so she was kind of wondering about that, especially because when she visited with some of the, the people in the choir, some were very accomplished musicians and had been in other bell choirs and, and knew very well what, uh, what they were um, getting into. And then there were other people that didn't even know how to read music for goodness sake. So where do you start with a bell choir where you've got people who can't read music and others that can read it very well? She was in a conversation with one of the members of that bell choir who suggested to her that, you know, what would be best is for you to actually start by um, getting the, the ones that don't know much about being a, in a bell choir. Start with them. Start with them so that they can become more accomplished over time, and that later on uh, we'll all be able to do more complex works together uh, because they'll be getting up to speed. So it's best to start with that. I was thinking about that as she was telling me that story. I was thinking, of course, about, about whether or not I should be preaching this series, and I got to thinking about that, and I put together um, that with something else I read in The Courier. Um, do you... Uh, do you read that section uh, that's called Call the Courier? I guess you can call the courier. I, I didn't know people actually would do this, but they, they make a phone call, they ask a question of the courier, and the courier responds. So last um, September 3rd edition, I found this, and I, and I set it aside because I couldn't believe this, uh, this actual question. It was this. I told my friend, this is the question that, that came in. I told my friend that if English was good enough for Jesus, yeah, see, I stopped there too. I was like, if English was good enough for Jesus. So if English was good enough for Jesus, it should be good enough for everybody else and everyone should have to speak it. And my friend said to me, Jesus didn't speak English. Then how can we read his words in English in the Bible? It was, it was that moment, putting that together with what Karen had experienced that I realized, yeah, I think it, it would be a good idea. I have no idea where to go, but I think the beginning might be a good place to start. And so if you're a very much an accomplished um, Bible reader and you've got that uh, kind of deeply a part of, of uh, your daily practice, um, perhaps what I'm about to share uh, in the next 10 minutes or so is, is uh, not material that, uh, that's new to you. But consider it from that perspective of someone that thinks Jesus spoke English because uh, they're reading English, and then you'll get as to why I'm starting where I'm 
starting. It was clear to me in that moment that making sense of the Bible is an important place for us uh, to, uh, to wrestle with. Well, questions like that, where, where does uh, the English version of, uh, of the Bible come from is something that I want to explore with us, but there are other questions that, that folks ask, um, and I, I know that because they'll, they'll wrestle with me about them in Bible studies over the years. How reliable is the writing of the New Testament? Is it, uh, is it something that we can actually um, feel is, is true and, and honest? Um, it was written decades after Jesus' time, so how faithful is it to, uh, to actual history? Is it historical? Who decided what makes up uh, the contents of the, uh, the Bible, um, the 27 books that we have? And, and thoughtful Christians will read closely the stories of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection, and they will find points in which there's a bit of contradiction between witnesses, between gospel writers, and that makes them wonder about how reliable is this witness if the witnesses can't even get it the same page, right? I mean, you talk to a lawyer, if they, uh, if they find that they're witnesses that don't get the same story, you can kind of work them against each other and you can win your, your law um, uh, debates uh, because of that. So if the witnesses of, of the gospel have variations, how do we make sense of whether or not this is reliable? Um, in content to read. So here's, um, here's the thing, as I shared with the children, uh, the, the New Testament is just a, about 25% of, uh, of our overall scripture, and the earliest Christians saw these writings as bearing witness to Jesus and Jesus' life and, and death and resurrection. And uh, um, last week we looked at the Old Testament and the categories of scripture there, the the Pentateuch, the five um, books that, that begin the, uh, the Old Testament, and then some historical writings. And, and so the, the New Testament has a, has a similar flow um, to that, um, ending with Revelation, a more prophetic uh, writing, just as, as the Old Testament has prophetic words as well. Let's, let's compare the New Testament organization to what we looked at last week. Take a look at this, this video clip. Testament, but you realize they're not all really books. In fact, uh, they're all written in different forms. Um, many of them are actually letters, letters written to the early church. So um, we kind of shorthand refer to them as the books of the Bible, but we know that the content um, that is found within the New, New Testament is, uh, is various writings and poetry and history. Um, there's a lot of different content. Um, and so that uh, depiction of, of a library shelf um, is, is one that uh, is a helpful way of, of imagining what it is when we look at the, at the Bible, we're looking at a, a collection of writings. A, a Bible is a, is a bookshelf in a lot of ways. Let me continue by discussing the development of the New Testament. How is it developed? The situation can be explained by, by some um, teachers of the Bible in three stages of development. Stage one is, uh, is everything that Jesus said and did during his life on earth. Stage two was what the disciples and the apostles taught and preached and, and gave testimony about the stage one experiences of Jesus. And then finally, stage three, the authors of the Gospels, they, they sifted out what, uh, what the teachings of the disciples and the apostles 
um, was. And so that's the stage three. So to be clear, all we have when we look at the four Gospels is stage three material. So Jesus didn't write these things down himself. He wasn't writing them down as he went. He wasn't writing a journal. The Gospels are not his, uh, his retelling of what occurred and his understanding of it. What we have is that we have stage three material that if we are trying to get back to the historical Jesus, we have a bit of a problem then because we have stage three material to get back to stage one happenings. And so you, you have that uh, built in right into the scripture as to the fact that the accounts that are out there um, are, are kind of third stage. They're not firsthand experience um, in the time of Jesus. And they were written um, many years after. So the earliest book, Mark, was written um, in around 65 AD. So um, that's, you know, about 30 years removed from Jesus' death and resurrection. They didn't, didn't think to write these things down until much later, um, and it was the third stage. So we, uh, we encounter in an introduction to the Gospel of Luke, it begins with, with these words, and I think it speaks to this notion of, uh, of how the scripture was written. Luke chapter one, verses one through four. Since many have undertaken to set down an orderly account of the events that have been fulfilled among us, just as they were handed on to us by those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and servants of the word, I too decided, after investigating everything carefully from the very first, to write down an orderly account for you, most ex excellent Theophilus so that you may know the truth concerning the things about which you have been instructed. So the gospel writer Luke um, is even making reference to other orderly accounts. He's, he's saying that there are many different accounts that are out there. I'm, I'm writing my account of it as I, as I find most faithful. And so he's, he's writing to uh, this one Theophilus, and, and many, and I agree with, with uh, many who say that Theophilus may be referring to all of us, writing to, to those um, who are, are seeking to, to love God most fully through, through the retelling of Jesus' story. So, so we all become Theophilus in this, uh, this reading of, of the gospel of Luke. With this in mind, um, let's consider this, uh, what some scholars call the four-source hypothesis to where the, the, uh, the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke came from. So Mark is, is the earliest understood writing of Scripture. When, uh, when looked at closely, it was the, the, the earliest. Um, it has 16 chapters within the Gospel of Mark, and so it's, uh, it's the shortest. Um, which makes sense that then there's a lengthier versions in Matthew and Luke because they're adding to uh, accounts in, in, in greater ways, but they were using Mark. They, they knew Mark's account, and so there, there's a lot of content that you'll find in Matthew that is direct. I mean, it's directly from Mark. You can compare them. You can put them parallel. There are even Bibles that do this, have parallel gospels in which you can look and see that the the Greek words are exactly the same at that, at that point. Luke does the same, uh, uses some of Mark. So Matthew, though, has content that is unique completely to Matthew. So that's what the M on this side is about. M is Matthew material. And so there's Matthew um, that, uh, that only uses that. And then the same goes for Luke, where there's only writings in Luke that Luke writes about. And so the L is referring to the Lucan content that's unique to Luke. There's one other source, Q. Now Q is kind of an interesting letter, don't you think? I mean, I, when you see a letter like Q, it's like who, who came up with Q? Well, um, it was a German um, interpreter of scripture that came up with this. And the word that he's actually trying to use is source, quilla, in, in, the, in the German is, is source, and so that's, it would be an S if it was English, but the German guy figured it out. So he says there, there seems to be this, this source material that is also in both Matthew and Luke, but it's not in Mark. So that's the four source hypothesis of, of understanding where scripture came from. Um, so, so Matthew, Mark, Q and L all are, are content that make up 
the, the three synoptic gospels. They call them synoptic because they're so similar, so much that they have in, in common. Some skeptics um, use this complexity of explanation to come up with a, a conspiracy theory that, that the church has just been trying to mess with people all these, this, this is just a part of a conspiracy theory. It's so complex. I don't think that's at all the case. I think this, for me, it makes it a bit more rich to, to understand uh, where the scriptures came from, where the gospels came from in the first place. Uh, the witness of the gospels reveals that, uh, that they, uh, they, they're somewhat a, a bit more reliable because they have some uniqueness to them and, uh, and some understanding that they are, are trying to convey. Now, the Gospel of John is, is seen as kind of um, outside of those three in the sense that 92% of the material that's in John is not found in any of the uh, other three Gospels. So a lot of John is, is in a different kind of understanding. In fact, when you read the Gospel of John, it's a, it's a bit more spiritual. Um, and, uh, and not as much um, trying to tell the historical fact, it's trying to get at the, the spirit um, level of, of what's going on in Jesus' life, death and resurrection. So that, that last graphic, you wanna show that again for me? Um, that's just showing the percentage. Uh, my former uh, math and, and science self likes to see that kind of thing. So, um, and the rest of you are like, whatever. So at, at any rate, that's, uh, that's the percentages as it kind of divides up when they look closely at, uh, at the connections that are made between Matthew, Mark, um, Luke, and, and, uh, and then John being separate from, from those, those three. My point is that, uh, that I find this uh, more helpful to, to understanding um, the makeup of the Gospels. Um, the Gospels and the letters of the early church were written not simply to record the story of Jesus, but to, to share the story of Jesus in a particular way so that their faith community might be enlivened to, to live out this, this faith story of following Jesus. John notes this in the close of his gospel in, in chapter 20 um, at the uh, tail end of the gospel of John. He writes this, Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing, you may have life in his name. That's the essence of what each of the Gospels is really trying to convey, that you might have life in Jesus' name. They are, they're, they're telling the story in order that we might become uh, a bit more connected with, uh, with our faith by by doing this. So that's, that's in part my point about sharing this, is to, to help us understand the origins of the Gospels and, uh, and how they were written and how they were striving to tell the story of Jesus' life, his actions, um, in different ways they do this. And that, that, uh, that makes sense to me, that, that a different witness, a different collector of the stories is gonna tell it in a particular way. Um, they're reliable accounts because of that, um, because they have some value of trying to, to share with their community a particular understanding that they want to, uh, to bring home. Now here's the thing. Um, it wasn't until the second century when the church finally decided what was gonna be the 27 um, books, uh, letters, um, content of the New Testament. Um, so 170 years after the resurrection, they began to, to say what, what's most important, and they began to think about this. Um, and that process of, of formulating the four Gospels and the Acts of the Apostles and, and the valuable letters of, of Paul and, and other early Christians uh, to be um, offered as, as documents of the church that would be sacred, holy, um, and, and w something for us to, to consider as a community of faith. So that brings me to a, a final point. How was it decided um, what books would be included in the Bible? Now, first of all, I should have said something about the English thing, uh, that, that question to call to the courier. So um, our English version is a translation of the Greek, right? All of the New Testament was written originally in Greek, um, and that Jesus spoke Aramaic. So there's a little touch of Aramaic within some of the Gospels as well. Um, Jesus never spoke English. Uh, that's for our good, that, uh, that we understand what's, uh, what's being told, because 
many of us, myself included, um, don't speak another language, so we don't know the original Greek. So my final point is this, how did they decide what would be the, the content that would, that would bring together um, the Bible as we have it today? This question is summarized in a single word, and that word is canon. Canon is a, a Latin word, um, and it means rule or standard, measuring stick, the rule. This is what is, uh, is going to be uh, included and, uh, and given. The process is called canonization. I paid thousands of dollars for that word. I'm giving it to you for free. Canonization is, uh, is, is something that um, it was a process of, of them deciding what was most faithful. So there, there were actually um, letters and contents of the Bible that were considered on the fence as to whether or not they were going to make it in. You might guess as to what those were, but, uh, but Revelation, for instance, was almost not included um, because it was such a unique, different uh, format and and um, understanding from the rest of the, the writings. Um, it, it was actually the case that James, and Martin Luther actually felt this way about James, he didn't think it was a worthy um, letter to include as scripture, which just hurts me, because I really love the letter of James. I like what, what it has to say and teach. Um, but that was on the fence. Uh, Hebrews, second and third John, were also um, letters that, uh, that were considered perhaps not gonna make the cut weren't going to be canonized um, and, and a part of that process. You'll be ready now for that game of trivial pursuit whenever, whenever needed. Um, I, I, I commend that uh, to you. So I tell you this, all of this because of the process of canonization can sometimes be hijacked by conspiracy theorists and murder mystery writers um, as a way of, of kind of saying that the Roman church is out to get us. You know, they, they did all this to, to kind of um, um, create a conspiracy. And uh, that's, that's just not um, further from the truth uh, in, in my mind. That's not, that's not ex that's, it's a great way to make some money if, if, you're, if you're Dan Brown and you wanna do the Da Vinci Code thing, but, uh, but that's not actually what was behind the creation of our, our New Testament um, and the collection that uh, has been scripture for us. It was generally a function of what the majority of Christians found helpful, what they found uh, enlivening to their faith, that they um, shared this as being the content. So overall, this is the focus I understand the Gospels and the letters of Paul and the letters of the early church were all about. They were not for information, they were for transformation. They were to transform us from being um, just uh, spectators of the Gospels and the, and the early church to being actors, proclaimers, folks who witness to the faithfulness of Jesus' story, his life, death, and resurrection. All of that is for us to be transformed into being followers of Christ more fully. All right, so now you know all that I know. There it is. Uh, maybe I know a little for a few things, but you know, detail-wise, that's, that's the content of what most pastors can tell you about making sense of the, the New Testament. For me, knowing this process of how this collection of, of works that is, is uh, important to our community of faith um, has helped me understand it more fully, and I experience God um, in, in critical ways and in faithful ways by reading this collection of writings on a regular basis. Every day I immerse myself in, in looking at scripture um, from different angles, and, uh, and I find commentaries on the scriptures to be some of the most interesting readings to, uh, to making me understand and make sense of scripture um, you know, in a deep way. Let me close uh, this morning with a, a story. It's told by Eugene Peterson. Eugene Peterson wrote uh, the translation known as The Message. He put it into a contemporary English version. I, I commend it to you if you're looking to, to get back into reading scripture. It can be an easy way to, uh, to read it because he does translate uh, the words into to modern English um, in a great way. But this, this actual story comes from a book he wrote um, entitled Eat This Book, Eat This Book. He, uh, he wrote um, about uh, reading scripture. He talks about the story of his, uh, his wife um, going out on a, uh, a day with, uh, with their grandson, who at the time was seven years old. Um, their grandson's name was and is Hans. It was an October Saturday, and, uh, and they were making their way um, to, to seeing um, the museum 
and they were out to lunch, and, uh, and they were going to be going to this local museum. There was going to be a special children's exhibit of gemstones, and they, they really both thought that, uh, that Hans would just love that, uh, that outing with, uh, with his wife. And so on the way to, um, to that museum, they stopped at a city park, and they had made lunch for themselves, and they were going to sit on a park bench and, uh, and have their sandwiches as they... Um, we're going to then go on to the museum. And the two of them um, ate while they were sitting on the park bench, and Hans had been chattering all the whole trip, you know, the drive, and just, you know, he had, he had complete attention of his grandmother, and so he was just talking away and just chattering. Um, and, uh, and then he pulled out his lettuce and mayonnaise sandwich because he told his grandmother that he was trying to eat more healthy, and so that's what he wanted for you know, lettuce and mayonnaise. Yeah, it's a great sandwich. So um, there they were uh, sitting on this park bench and, and Hans um, shifts away from his grandmother for a moment and, and, and gets into his, uh, his bag that he had his lunch in um, and he faced um, into the park more and away from his grandmother, but he, you know, she could see over his shoulder. He was getting into his book bag and he pulled out a New Testament, uh, just the New Testament scripture that had been given to him uh, from his his pastor um, just a, a few weeks before. And uh, he began to, to look at the New Testament and he was moving his eyes back and forth across the page and devoutly, uncharacteristically, silently, he was doing this without speaking, just, just looking at uh, this New Testament. And after a long minute or so, he closed the, the Testaments and he returned it to his book bag and he said, okay, Grandma, I'm ready, let's go to the museum. His grandmother was impressed, just really uh, proud. Um, she was also amused because Hans cannot read at the age of seven. He was not able to read. So what is it that, uh, that Hans was, was doing? Uh, the two of them got to thinking about later. What, did, what was Hans up to? And especially Eugene Peterson, who had been the translator of scripture, was wondering about what, what is a young man doing who can't read and who says this out loud he says i can't read and he's kind of envious of his older sister who can read what is he doing reading the new testament in the park on that autumn saturday well peterson got to thinking about it and he got to thinking about how hans um, gives us a focus about this business of of reading the bible made me think about it a little deeper too. I became a pastor over 20 years ago and I've spent a long time reading scripture and trying to immerse myself in the understandings of Christian scriptures and get it into my mind and heart and, and make it a part of who I am. What is it that this young man was doing that day when he can't read, what was he, he experiencing? Well, the challenge is that scripture needs to be more than just an action we take in a devotional moment. It needs to move beyond that to an action that actually moves us to be living it, to living what it is that we read. At some point, we, we end learning to read, and we move to read to learn. And that focus, my friends, is what we are striving for when we read Scripture, we're reading to learn, learn something about our faith, our, our understanding of, of Christ, our understanding of God more fully. We read to be transformed into the body of Christ, into followers of Christ more fully. What I want to say is that in order to read the Scripture adequately and accurately, it's necessary at some point in our lives to truly encounter it for what it is, to read it in such a way that that we, uh, we embody it after we've read it. Reading the scripture is not an activity that, uh, that's, uh, that's something separate from the rest of our lives. It's, it's a part of who we, we are as followers of Christ. I think Hans gives us kind of a, an insight into, into what can happen. Sometimes we're just going through the motions when we're looking and reading, but what is it to, to read in such a way that it becomes a part of who we are, transforming us into followers of Christ most fully. Next Sunday, we'll take a deeper dive into the nature of Scripture, this, this notion of, of it being revelation for us, being transformative for us.
that we might explore that. So stay tuned for next week as we continue making sense of Scripture together. Amen.